developing an unwavering faith in God. An unwavering faith in God in times of trial leads to deliverance. September 1st, 2019, Hurricane Dorian hit the Bahamas. It took a devastating toll on those that inhabited the island. Many lost everything they owned, while some lost even more, like that of a child or their own life. Hurricanes are a common thing in the Bahamas. How is it that they continue to live there, knowing that this is going to happen to them again and again? What about us? We also face reoccurring trials in life, some devastating, like the loss of a loved one or the news of a terminal illness. What keeps us going? Let us examine the life of Moses as written in the book of Exodus. This is a man that faced numerous trials which led to the growth of his faith and eventually his deliverance. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. In this lesson, we will consider the man Moses, the journey he took, the trials he had to endure, and how these brought him to a place of an unwavering faith and deliverance. What I believe this lesson will show us is the trials we endure will help us to cultivate an unwavering faith in God in times of adversity so we can be led to deliverance as well. First, let us consider the journey of Moses and the life he had from the time that he left Egypt and consider the growth he gleaned from God speaking to him through the burning bush. Let us consider that Moses knows who God is and had a healthy fear of him, thus implying some degree of faith. Exodus 3, 6, Moreover he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. At this time, we understand that Moses has a wavering faith at best, not truly trusting that the Lord will give him the insight and strength that he needs to stand unshaken in the disbelief of his own people as he continuously makes excuses to the Lord. Exodus 3, 10 through 4, 1. I know it's a lengthy reading, but it is pertinent. God says, Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, and that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Moses' excuse. And Moses said unto God, Who am I, that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? God says, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee, that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. He's already telling Moses the future. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said to Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. And God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. And God continues to tell Moses exactly what is going to happen in comfort, so Moses knows what is going to happen. Go and gather the elders of Israel together, and say unto them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, appeared unto me saying, I have surely visited you, and seen that which is done to you in Egypt. And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt unto the land of the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. And they shall hearken to thy voice, and thou shalt come, thou and the elders of Israel, unto the king of Egypt. And he shall say unto him, The Lord God of the Hebrews hath met with us. And now, let us go, we beseech thee, three days' journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. And I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go, no, not by a mighty hand. And I will stretch out my hand and smite Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in the midst thereof, and after that he will let you go. God has told Moses up to this point everything that is going to happen, and now he's going to tell them they won't leave empty-handed. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and it shall come to pass that when ye go, ye shall not go empty. But every woman shall borrow of her neighbor and of her that soldiereth in her house jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment, and ye shall put them upon your sons and upon your daughters, and ye shall spoil the Egyptians. What a beautiful thing God has just told Moses. And this is what Moses comes back with. 
And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. We, now, we can now concede the faith of Moses as it begins to bloom with the miracles that the Lord gives him to perform. Exodus 4, beginning in verse 2. And the Lord said unto him, What is it that is in thine hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, Cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. In the presence of God he flees before a serpent. And the Lord said unto Moses, Put forth thy hand, and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand, and caught it. And it became a rod in his hand that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath appeared unto thee. And the Lord said, Furthermore unto him, Put now thine hand into thy bosom. And he put his hand into his bosom. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was as leprous as snow. And, the Lord, and he said, Put thine hand into thy bosom again. And he put his hand into his bosom again, and plucked it out of his bosom. And behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. And it shall come to pass... If they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe also these two signs, neither hearken unto thy voice, that thou shalt take of the water of the river, and pour it upon dry land, and the water which thou takest out of the river shall become blood upon dry land. At this point, Moses now turns to a doubt in himself, in his own mouth. Exodus 4.10 And Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of slow tongue. We read of God rebuking him for this doubt, Exodus 4.11. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth, or who maketh the dumb, or deaf, or the seeing, or the blind, have, I, have not I the Lord? In his anger, the Lord still gives Moses an avenue to fulfill what he once done, Exodus 4.14. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well, and also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee, and when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. Moses finally runs out of excuses to the Lord, and sets off to do as he is asked, yet still lacking a complete faith. Exodus 4.18, And Moses went and returned to Jethro his father-in-law, and said unto him, Let me go, I pray thee, and return unto my brethren which are in Egypt, and see whether they be yet alive. And Jethro said to Moses, Go in peace. You have to wonder if Moses was actually hoping Jethro would tell him he couldn't go. And the Lord said unto Moses and Midian, Go return into Egypt, for all the men are dead which sought thy life. And Moses took his wife and his sons, and set them upon an ass, and he returned to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the rod of God in his hand. So we see that Moses was a man of faith, but he had a journey to take before he would become the man we read of in Exodus 14, 13, and 14. Let us now consider the tempering and growth of Moses' faith that he gained as a result of the destructive plagues that he, as the hand of the Lord, cast upon the people of Egypt. The Lord deemed it necessary to make Moses a God, or supreme one, to give him the unwavering faith that he needed to stand against the Pharaoh. Exodus 7, 1. And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a god to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. <clears throat> Moses saw through the first plagues that the Lord is the I Am. Exodus 7, 17. Thus saith and following, Thus saith the Lord, and this soul shall thus saith the Lord, and this thou shalt know that I am the Lord. Behold, I will smite with the rod that is in mine hand upon the waters which are in the river, and they shall be turned to blood. And the fish that is in the river shall die, and the river shall stink, and the Egyptians shall loathe to drink the water of the river. God tells Moses what's going to happen. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying unto, Say unto Aaron, Take thy rod, and stretch out thine hand upon the waters of Egypt, upon their streams, upon their rivers, and upon their ponds, and upon their pools of water, that they may become blood, and that there may be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone. And Moses and Aaron did so, as the Lord commanded. And he lifted up the rod, and smote the waters that were in the river in the sight of Pharaoh, and in the sight of his servants. And all the waters that were in the river were turned to blood. And the fish that was in the river died, and the river stank, and the Egyptians could not drink of the water of the river, and there was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. God did exactly as he told Moses what he was going to do. Moses no longer questioned the Lord's will, but does as he commands without hesitation or question. 
Exodus 8, 5, and 6. And the Lord spake unto Moses, say unto Aaron, Stretch forth thine hand with thy rod over the streams, over the rivers, and over the ponds, and cause frogs to come upon the land of Egypt. No more excuses. It, immediately Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. Again, in verses 16 and 17 of chapter 8. And the Lord said unto Moses, Say unto Aaron, Stretch out thy rod, and smite the, smite the dust of the land, that it may become lice throughout all the land of Egypt. And they did so, for Aaron stretched out his hand with its rod, and smote the dust of the earth, and it became lice in man, and in beasts, and all the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. His faith has become insurmountable through this and every following plague. Moses had come into his unwavering faith through the plagues, knowing that he as the Israelite, and the Israelites had been protected by God through all of them thus far. By the eighth plague, Moses' faith was unshaken by anything as a result of the fact that he saw the Lord protect him and the Israelites. Exodus 8.23 And I will put a division between my people and thy people. Tomorrow shall this sign be. Exodus 9, verse 4 And the Lord shall sever between the cattle of Israel and the cattle of Egypt, and there shall nothing die of all that is in the children that is the children of Israel's. And the Lord, and verse 6, And the Lord did that thing on the morrow, and all the cattle of Egypt died, but of the cattle of the children of Israel died not one. Uh, verse 11, And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boil was upon the magicians and upon all the Egyptians. Verse 26, Only in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were, was there no hail. This is illustrated now as we experience Moses' faith in all its glory as he ventures fearlessly into the hailstorm with no apprehension to his person. Exodus 9.33 And Moses went out of the city from Pharaoh and spread abroad his hands unto the Lord, and the thunders and hail ceased, and the rain was not poured upon the earth. I like what Matthew Henry said in his commentary about this verse. He went out of the city not only for privacy and his communion with God, but to show that he durst venture abroad into the field, notwithstanding the hail and lightning which kept Pharaoh and his servants within doors, knowing that every hailstone had its direction from his God, who meant him no hurt. We now can comprehend the strength and faith of Moses, and the Israelites prevail in the crossing of the Red Sea as they were delivered unto their salvation. We read of that once terrified man Moses, in all his glory in Exodus 14, 13 and 14, as he brazenly stood before the terror-stricken Israelites and proclaimed to them, Fear not, the Lord will fight for you. Through this fear, the Israelites mustered up a great faith and followed Moses across the Red Sea on dry land with towers of water on either side of them, never losing sight of their salvation to come. Exodus 14, 22. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon dry ground, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. This great act of faith by Moses and the Israelite people gained them mention in the New Testament as a people of great faith. In our chapter we call the chapter of faith, Hebrews 11 and verse 29. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians assigned to do, were drowned. This was a great act of faith. Moses' faith was quite a journey. He started with a weak faith. His faith was tempered and grew stronger. He finally, through each passing trial, grew to an unwavering faith. With his unwavering faith in his times of trial, he led not only himself, but the Israelite people to be delivered unto salvation. Although we may not encounter the same trials that Moses went through, we all have our trials to face. Like those that have gone through Hurricane Dorian, we too can face the trial of a lost child the loss of a loved one, the loss of all of our worldly possessions. As with Moses, the outcome can be the same for us as it, was, as it can be for those that went through the hurricane. It begins with allowing ourselves to be open to God's guidance. As we face our trials and see God working in our lives, our faith grows. Ultimately, the outcome of an unwavering faith in God in times of trial leads to deliverance unto salvation. Thank you.